Fabulous. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the seventh episode of the Balboa Park Online Collaboratives, Dreaming of a New Collections Management System. As many of you already know, my name is Alex Cron, and I am the Digital Operations and Collections Information Analyst for BPOC. Who should be here with me is BPOC's CEO, Nikani Set, as my co-host. Just joined. Yeah. Pound from hell has been subdued. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so today's episode, we have Megan Forbes, Linda Collette, and Aaron Griffith from Collection Space to share with us how the Collection Space team works to provide support for NAGRA, NAGPRA claims and consultations, speak on the various profiles that Collection Space has to support diverse collections, and the challenges of getting data in and out of our collections management systems. If you watched our DEAI session, you'll recognize that Collection Space is the CMS that Museum of Us utilizes to support their decolonization efforts. Now, before I introduce our guest speakers, I wanted to mention that we will open our discussion up for a Q&A at the end. Please put any questions you have in the Q&A section and feel free to comment and discuss in the chat. Today's session will be recorded. And if you are having difficulty with the transcription service, please let us know. Now, please welcome Megan, Linda, and Erin. Linda is the Senior Outreach Strategist for Collection Space. She has 20 plus years experience in outreach, strategic planning, and digital consulting for museums, libraries, and archives, and teaches art history at Northern Virginia Community College. She has a bachelor's and a master's in art history. Her current outreach work with Collection Space involves engaging with cultural institutions on how their collections management system needs fit within their overall digital strategy. Now we have Megan. Megan is the Collection Space Program Manager. She has over 15 years of experience working with museum collections and collections technology. Day to day, Megan leads the operations of the Collection Space organizational home, including software design and development, release planning, community engagement, and coordination with other Lyris' programs. She also serves as co-director for the IMLS-funded It Takes a Village project, which provides sustainability planning resources for open source software projects, serving cultural and scientific heritage. Prior to her work with Lyris, Megan was the director of the collection at the Museum of the Moving Image in New York, she has a master's in library and information studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you to the three of you for being here today. And now I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank I'm you. going to have Megan um, start up the slides and I will start introducing and then I will pass the baton to Megan after that. There you go. So good morning, everyone. Um, as Alex mentioned, my name is Linda Collette. I'm the Senior Outreach Strategist for Collection Space at Lyricis. And with me today is my colleague, Megan Forbes, the Collection Space Program Manager. And also joining us is Erin Griffith, our Outreach Coordinator, who will be helping us monitor the chat and the questions. First, I want to start to say thank you to the Balboa Park Online Collaborative for bringing together the GLAM community to discuss collections management systems in a series of moderated discussions. We are honored to be part of the series. Collection Space is an open source web-based and interoperable collections management system. In today's talk, we will address two important CMS topics that galleries, libraries, archives, and the museums are facing today. How collection space can help support work to manage information and workflows related to NAGPRA. NAGPRA stands for Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. And the challenges also, we'll also talk about the challenges of getting data in and out of your CMS. We will tell these stories using examples of how our community has used the collection space platform to support the, their institutional missions and visions. So I will introduce you to Collection Space and then pass the baton to Megan, who will take you on a deep dive into these topics. Next slide, please. So what is Collection Space? It's a web-based open source collections information management system in daily use out of a wide variety of museums and collections, from cataloging and loans to inventory and digital asset management. Collection space is used to manage many of the day-to-day -day activities of collection professionals who work with art, artifacts, objects, and specimens. 
As open source software, implementers can choose to self-host collection space for no cost or host in the cloud with Lyricist for a full service option. We began in 2008 as a collaboration amongst an international group of universities and museums working together to develop a collections management solution that would focus on what all collecting organizations have in common, rather than needing to support different platforms for every different collection type. Next slide. Next slide. Thanks. Collection Space has an organizational home at Lyricist, a nonprofit membership organization with a mission to support enduring access to the world's shared cultural heritage through leadership in open technologies, content services, digital solutions, and collaboration with museums, archives, and libraries. In this role as home organization, Lyricist supports Collection Space and the collections management community through innovation and thought leadership, community networking, professional development, organizational and financial support, and ongoing software development and hosting services. Lyricist also serves as the organizational home for a number of other open source platforms serving cultural and scientific heritage, including Archive Space, DSpace, Vivo, Fedora, and the Palace Project. Next. So with Lyricist, Collection Space doesn't do it alone and you don't have to either. We have built a robust network of partnership and consortiums, all of which are using and sharing collection space in innovative ways. And I'll give you some examples. So for our campus collections at the University of California, Berkeley, they use collection space to manage five collections on campus. And that includes the Hearst Museum of Anthropology, the Berkeley Art Museum and the Pacific Film Archives the Sin Files Collection, the University and Jepson Herbaria, and the UC Botanical Garden. And amongst them, these five collections manage millions of objects and hundreds of thousands of digital images. They have integrated collection space with digital asset management systems, federated search platforms, and collection browsers. We've also done specialized domains. For, for many years, we've worked with West Staff, um, to support their public art archive. It's an online resource that tra tracks images and data of art in public spaces, primarily in the United States. As the public art archive grew, this system became unsustainable. So West Staff reached out to Lyricist. Collection space is now in use at over 20 public arts organizations and also serves as the back end and for the public art archive. So the West Staff team benefits from collection space features such as shared authorities, user-friendly import tools and standard space data management. We also are really big in the shared cataloging and discovery area. And we have a particular consortium we work closely with which is the Material Order Consortium. The Harvard University Graduate School of Design and Rhode Island School of Design developed a homegrown database for describing their collections, but quickly realized that long-term maintenance of a custom platform was outside the financial reach of the institution supporting it. So they approached us in 2015 and we worked together to develop a profile of collection space to support specifically design materials collections. Material Order also worked with us to design and fund two pieces of functionality that improve support for community-based cataloging, shared authorities and a federated search. The other partnership and consortium we've worked on is NAGPRA. To help support NAGPRA work, we collaborate with our community members at Ohio History Connection, Museum of Us and UC Berkeley. We continue to add new features and functionality to support NAGPRA related workflows included including claims management, held in trust agreements, and osteology inventories. So for the Ohio History Connection, we created a custom export suited for Mukertu, so Ohio History Connection could provide a platform for sharing materials for tribal cons consultations. So we're involved in a lot of different projects. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll say it again, Collection Space is a community supported application. So these are some of the links that you can check out after the webinar when we share the slides. Our wiki is where we have all our in-progress stuff. 
What's our new procedure going to look like? What do we want the default fields to be in our public browser? Things like that. And our talk list is used by all implementers to have conversations with one another and ask for support. We also have a collections blog that we're using to tell the stories of our implementers, which can give you a great idea of what's possible with collection space. Next slide. So our technical roadmap and development priorities are led by our community and always publicly available. Our version seven release is due this month and it includes new procedures for managing transport and insurance and indemnity, improvements to our public browser to allow users to create stories about groups of objects and a brand new CSV import tool that provides everyone with the ability to import new records into collection space or you could round trip your data out and back in again for a cleanup process. Looking forward to our next release, we're very excited to integrate a new audit trail features um, that will provide the edit history for every field in the system, a pilot integration with archive space and support for single sign-on. Integrations are a real big part of our roadmap moving forward and those are made easier with the collection space API. All the data in collection space is available via the native API. It's not something that was tacked on or something that users need to pay extra to access. So we're also part of the larger efforts happening at Lyricist, including an effort to harmonize subsets of data across all the OSS programs and spec out how a shared discovery platform might work and participating in requirements gathering for the next generation of DuraCloud for digital preservation. Next slide. A research project we collaborated with BPOC on in 2018 found that most organizations tend to stick with their CMS for more than 10 years. We'd like everyone to be able to try collection space out before committing. And we have a number of ways you can do that. We have a demo site up that has the latest version of collection space installed and open for anyone to try out. And we're always happy to schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings to talk through your specific use cases. We can also set up a private sandbox for you for 30 days and import some data into it so that you can really get a feel for how collection space would fit your organization and workflows. So now I'll turn the presentation over to Megan to walk through in more detail some of our features and functionality. But first, I want to see if there's any questions before we move on. OK, over to Megan. Sorry, my unmute button was hidden and didn't want to come back to me. Um, thanks, Linda. Um, so good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I know we have at least one European on the call. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. Um, and I will try to move quickly through the slides um, so that we do have um, time for questions at the end. But I think feel free to interrupt me, Alex. I don't want to step on your toes, but I think people can you know, bust in with questions if they want. Um, and Alex will, will let me know if anybody wants to spend more time on a topic. So I'm going to do just a really quick spin through the basic features and functionality of collection space, and then we'll get more specific um, with some, some user stories. Um, so as Linda mentioned, collection space provides standards-based collections management features and functionality. So cataloging, accessions, deaccessions, loans, exhibitions, storage locations, you know, all the things that, that we need to do our job as collections managers and registrars and curators. Um, so here's a screenshot of a standard cataloging screen. Um, I'm happy to do a live demo, but um, we don't have a ton of time. So I thought that screenshots might just make it a little bit um, faster than everybody just watching me type for 20 minutes. Um, but the slide on the last screen, if anybody goes to core.collectionspace.org, you're welcome to hop in and, and just follow along with us here. Um, so this is the collection space, our standard user interface. Um, so lots of good support built in for data validation, pick lists, widgets that really help us maintain those good data management practices in our organizations. Collection space has robust tools to store and describe a wide variety of digital assets. So images, documents, PDFs, Excel spreadsheets, audio and video files, um, you know, whatever you like, you can upload and store directly in collection space. Um, we had a question come in in advance about integrating with digital asset management systems, um, which some of our implementers do. Um, 
harkening back to that, the, the study that, that Nick and, and Julia led at BPOC, um, they found that probably, I think it, Nick, it was like more than half of people tend to use their CMS also as their dams. And I think our percentage is probably even higher with collection space, um, but some do integrate with, with third-party dams. Um, so in, now, in those cases, folks use the collection space API um, to connect with that dams. Um, so different solutions, depending on what they want the integration to look like. Um, integration is one of those words that has a million meanings and no meanings, right? Everybody sort of means something different when they say it. So it might be that folks just want to send data out to the digital asset management system. So they might be having that one way the dams is pulling some metadata so that, you know, then when they upload their images, they have those object IDs. Um, some folks are going two ways. So they're sending data out, metadata out to the dams and then pulling thumbnails back into their systems. Um, so that integration is really just a matter of making sure on our side that we have the right API endpoint um, and that then users have a way of flagging or kicking off um, you know, data, data flowing out to the dams. Um, but we're happy to have more specific conversations about integrating with specific dams if, if anybody would like to do that. Um, collection space supports controlled vocabularies, of course, for managing people, places, concepts, storage locations. Um, authorities and vocabularies can be locally developed. Um, resources such as the nomenclature can be imported. Um, and then Linda mentioned, we also have shared authority. So if we have a group of organizations that wants to have the same person list, the same place authority, um, those can be shared and then synced out to any number of collection spaces so that uh, groups of organizations can share that same list. Um, we have a library of reports that come with collection space. Users can also develop their own um, using our reporting engine, Jasper, which we have an integration with. Um, but we also have an ad hoc reporting functionality that lets users pull just the fields that they need from search results and then export them as a CSV, right, which you can open in Excel. Um, so ad hoc reporting gets really useful uh, when you couple it with the CSV importer, because then you can export fields, clean them up, use Excel, use Open Refine, what have you, um, and then put them back into collection space. Um, you can also use that CSV importer to create entirely new records in, in CSpace. Um, so one example, um, if you know, you're know you thinking to yourself, gee, I wish that all of my cataloging records had colors, but most of them don't, you could run a search for all of the fields, all of the records rather, where the color field is blank, export that as a CSV, go into your storage room, send your intern, your volunteer, yourself, go in, fill in all those colors, um, and then put that right back in through the CSV importer. Um, uh, Alex mentioned in her intro that I used to work at the Museum of the Moving Image in New York, and we used to get in new acquisitions that would have hundreds and sometimes thousands of objects. Sometimes it's easier just to do that quick inventory in Excel. And again, then you can use that CSV importer um, just, to, just to put it all right back into collection space. So that's a new tool with our latest release um, that we're really excited about. Um, we do have a public collections browser. Um, so collections can be shared online. Um, the public browser is a plugin that just sits inside your existing content management system. So it's not a freestanding website, it's just a plugin. So if you have WordPress, it's a WordPress plugin. If you have Drupal, it's a Drupal module. Um, and it just pulls data directly from an elastic search index in collection space. So whatever you choose to make available will go right into that public browser. Um, and then there's faceted searching um, to narrow down those collections. We'll talk a little bit about um, the data model. Um, so the core CSpace data model is based on the Spectrum documentation standard. Um, so Spectrum focuses on those things that most museums have in common. So we all have names, we all have identification numbers and storage locations, right? Regardless of whether we're collecting flowers or paintings of flowers or video game called flower, um, we do all have those things in common. Um, if you're not familiar with Spectrum, it's a really ecumenical standard, right? It doesn't presume that you have an art collection or an anthropology collection, just that you have something that you've collected that you wanna document properly. So that said, there are of course differences in how domains catalog their objects. And so communities of practice then work together to develop extension sets to support specific workflows. So the first puzzle piece is just spectrum. And then you can add an extension set. Um, so for example, we're working with the Museum of the Moving Image right now um, to add new extensions to, to better support born digital materials. Um, so we'll plug that right into that core data model. Um, can also add institution specific fields. So if the 
director's mother needs to weigh in on new acquisitions, you know, we can put in that checkbox, you know, to, to get that approval as well. We've bundled together different groups of extension sets into profiles that implementers can start from. So rather than having to start with scratch and say like, oh, which extension sets do I need? Do I need common? Do I need core? Um, you can start with a specific profile and then hopefully that gets you most of what you need um, to go ahead and catalog your collection. Um, so we currently have eight profiles supporting anthropology, bonsai gardens, botanical gardens, design materials, uh, finding contemporary art, herbaria, local history, uh, and public art. Um, and for me, one of the most interesting things, you know, working with collection space for so long um, is how similar all the profiles actually are. Um, and so it's not an instance where, you know, you can go, we've got demos up for all of them. You can go to botgarden.collectionspace.org or materials.collectionspace.org. Um, and really that core platform of collection space is intact throughout all of those. Um, and then people add bits and pieces on um, to support different things. But the core is really similar across all of those profiles, which I think, again, speaks to this, you know, we don't need to support a lot of different um, platforms. We just need one platform that we can extend and then we can all, all pitch in and support it together. Um, so the design materials, you know, might not think they have so much in common with public art, but their systems really are really similar at the end. Alex, were there any, I see there were, I can't see the Q and A. Did anybody want me to pause and answer anything or do you want me to wait? So answer. yes, we do have a couple questions uh, regarding the dams. Um, sure. Catherine's asking what dams? So right now the integration that I'm aware of is with Piction, um, but because we're open source, people don't need to tell us if they're downloading and using the application. So there might be others, but Piction is the one that I'm aware of. Then we have one more and I can answer this one. Uh, the presentation is being recorded and we will be sharing it later. <clears throat> I know I'm a fast talker, <laughs> so I, I'll, I can try to slow down, but it won't, it'll only last for one slide. Um, so, okay, super, thanks, Alex. Um, so now we're gonna move on and talk a little bit about some stories um, from some of our users. So we have a number of implementers using the anthropology profile of collection space, which supports uh, natural history collections, anthropology, and ethnography. Um, and before talking about what collection space was, I do just want to take 30 seconds uh, to make a quick clarification about what it doesn't do. Um, so the word decolonization, um, it comes up, it's in heavy use uh, these days, and Kara Vetter at the Museum of Us gave a really wonderful talk about the work that they're doing in that space um, a few webinars ago. So the way that I think about decolonization, though, is that it's really about people, not platforms. So we will talk today about using things like NAGPRA and processes around claims and consultations. Uh, but no matter how amazing a CMS is, um, it's never going to be able to supplant that hard work necessary to reflect on institutional practices, decide you need to change, work with your community to understand the best way to change, and then commit to those consistent decolonization practices in your organization. Um, so, Collection space is there to provide support once that work's been done, um, but it's certainly not gonna do the work for you, unfortunately. Um, so that said, I'm really glad that I get to work with collection space and help grow and evolve the platform to support the community as it changes and, and as it leads us in new directions. Okay, so polemic over. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, NAGPRA, the Native American Graves uh, Protection and Repatriation Act, is a federal law that enacted in 1990 that requires federal agencies and institutions that receive federal funds to repatriate or transfer Native American human remains and other cultural items to the appropriate parties. So very sort of legalese there. So easy to read off a slide and a ton of work uh, to do well within organizations holding NAGPRA eligible collections. Um, so we've worked with our colleagues at the Hearst, at the Museum of Us, at the Ohio History Connection, um, to add new functionality to support that work. Um, and so just like the NAGPRA work um, in museums, our work on collection space is ongoing. So it's not like, you know, here's what we do to support NAGPRA and it's done and dusted. Um, this is something that is continually changing. We have new things going in all the time. So for example, right now, NAGPRA, the law, 
um, is undergoing a major update. So it's in the um, consultation and comment phase um, right now. Um, and so it's undergoing this update to improve how NAGPRA eligible, eligible materials are classified within museum collections. Um, and honestly, just to make the entire process less onerous, there's so much regulatory sort of burden around it. And so the goal of the updated regulations are to make it easier for everybody to comply. Um, one of the biggest changes under consideration is changing what are currently called culturally unaffiliated materials. Um, so these are materials that have insufficient evidence. So I'm gonna put some air quotes around that, insufficient evidence to affiliate them with a federally recognized tribe. Um, with, they'd like to change that culturally unaffiliated to geographically affiliated. Um, so that's establishing the connection between a cultural resource and a present day tribe by identifying a relationship between the tribe and a location and a location and a resource. Um, so there are a lot, a lot of things that are stuck in this sort of NAGPRA limbo because of this lack of evidence. And so this is an attempt to say, okay, if we can tie the tribe to a place and the place to a resource, then maybe we can get a lot of these objects out of limbo um, and repatriated. Um, and so to support that, if museums will be able to link these geographic records to resources and really, again, try and remove all these things from limbo, um, we need to make sure that we have really good place records attached to these cultural resources. So in this screenshot, um, we can see some of the work that we've been doing with our colleagues at the Hearst. So right now, this is live at the Hearst and it will be rolled into our next release. So not the release that's coming out this month, um, but, but our next release, 7-1. Um, and so what we've done is add fields to their place authority records where they can include all of the research that they've done on affiliating places with peoples. Um, so they might be, so we have this cultural affiliation lines of evidence. And then in this, this thing field that says assertion name, there's all sorts of ways that we can be asserting this evidence. So it might be here, we have geographic evidence. You might have kinship evidence, you might have folklore evidence. So all these different ways that we're saying, here's all the pieces of evidence that we have that tie this place to these people. And rather than have that stuck in NAGPRA inventories on people's hard drives or paper records, we're trying to get it all into collection space so that we have that one central source of all the information that we need um, to keep track of all this, this information right in, right in the collection space. Another uh, great thing that we're working on uh, with the Hearst is the held in trust agreement. So in some cases, uh, repatriated items or human remains belonging to an ancestor will continue to be housed in a museum. Um, and so in those cases, the held in trust agreement really outlines what the museum's responsibilities are toward those items. And it's a confirmation that they belong to the tribe and that the tribe, the nation, the band can request that they be returned at any time. The procedure also includes space for handling preferences. So descendant community might say, well, the museum can hold the materials, but please don't put them on exhibit or they can't be photographed or we need to approve any research requests. So it's really putting that power um, on the owners of the materials. And then again, the museum is just holding them in trust. So. A little inside baseball, when we were first talking about this procedure, we thought, well, can we just adapt the loan agreement? Is this really just extra fields on an acquisition record? Um, but at the end of the day, it's really not, right? The, that's not how they're there and that's not why they're there. So we figured, you know, as a group that a new procedure for this really different way of thinking about things was the most appropriate way to do it. So that's, that's our held in trust procedure. Um, and just to say, you know, this work was led by the Hearst, so this is a code contribution that they made to this open source project, um, but it was with the participation of our other collections that hold NAGPRA eligible materials. So the Hearst says, here are the fields that we think would be useful. We drop a wireframe, we share that out with the community, people respond. So this changed quite a bit from the initial design. Um, and then they come around and then the Hearst does that work and contributes it back. Um, so this helps a lot on the long-term maintenance front. Um, it's a lot better for the Hearst to work with everybody and have that code contributed back to the core because then it becomes a lyricist issue uh, to maintain it in the long-term rather than them going out on their own. And then it's code that they need to you know, maintain and deal with over the long-term. So this is a really great collaboration among our community and also working with the home org to get this into the core code. So then it becomes maintained and released along with the rest of our, with the rest of our code. 
Um, the next story um, is about the Ohio History Connection um, and the, the content management system, Mukatu. Um, so at the heart of NAGPRA, um, and so these words are from Ohio history. So at the heart of NAGPRA is consultation and consultation serves a couple of different purposes. It's relationship building, it's earning trust where often there's a real lack of trust. Um, it's about respecting, it's about respecting both sides. So understanding that, you know, where the expertise is and that, you know, being able to share that, give up some of that control um, and allowing for transparency. So OHC has an archeology span collection with, it says here, 1.6 million artifacts um, representing more than 14,000 years of occupation within the current boundaries of the state of Ohio. Within that collection, um, they hold the remains of over 7,000 American Indian ancestors and over 110,000 associated funerary objects. Um, so those collections have been reported to NAGPRA um, when the law was passed in 1990, then most museums created inventories that were then published with, um, with NAGPRA, National NAGPRA, which is a division of the National Park Service. Um, but then not a lot happened after that, um, after those initial inventories were published. Um, so in 2018, uh, Ohio History uh, received a grant from National NAGPRA. Uh, they partnered with the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma, the Delaware Nations, the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi and Seneca Nation. Um, on this grant. And the core goal was to build a research portal that tribal representatives could access the NAGPRA eligible collections, information about the NAGPRA eligible collections um, that OHC is holding. Um, and so what they first thought that they would do was develop a custom portal. Um, so they wanted a way to say to all of, the, um, all of their tribal advisors, you know, here are all the materials that we have um, OHC has a big collection um, and many, many, many of the materials in that collection are falling under that culturally you know, unaffiliated. Um, they don't have that cultural affiliation. So the idea of the portal was that it would facilitate these consultations so that then they could attach these cultural affiliations to all of their materials. Um, they thought that they would do a custom portal, but when they started talking to us, uh, we suggested that they take a look at Mukatu um, instead. So Mukatu is a content management system in use, um, digital heritage you know, management system in use by a large number of um, Native American, First Nations, Indigenous populations um, to manage their digital heritage. Um, so OHC took a look at Mukatu, thought that it would you know, do what they hoped it would. Um, we created an export of fields in C space. So we did a mapping. Here are the fields that are in Mukatu. Here's what's in C space. We did a map. We created an export so that they could get those fields out of collection space and then use the Mukatu importer to spin up their Mukatu site. We were able to get that done really quickly and they could share a prototype with their tribal advisors um, much faster than they thought they would be able to do, you know, a custom portal. And then the tribal advisors gave them the green light to move forward. We were really helped in this, um, going back to a couple slides to the ideas of trust. Um, Mukatu has worked very hard um, to gain a lot of trust and earn a lot of trust in the community over the years. And so we were really helped by that, um, that there was already such great trust and name recognition for Mukatu um, that they felt really comfortable giving the green light to the project um, once they knew that that was gonna be the platform for sharing. Um, so our next steps um, are to seek additional input from the tribal advisors to see how else we can expand this integration. Um, so, you know, one of the big things is making space for a tribal community to contribute their own content. Maybe that's TK, TK labels, maybe that's other things, and then being able to pull that information back into collection space. Um, one word we did do, um, the, the integration that we have um, is fairly manual, so you have to do a manual export like a report and then import it into Mukatu. Um, the reason we did that is that Mukatu is undergoing a major revision, um, and so we didn't want to do a real um, tight integration, knowing that it was going to have to change fairly quickly. So Mukatu 4 is coming out, I think at the end of this year. So they're moving, they're on Drupal 7 and they need to move to Drupal 8. And so it's gonna be a pretty major rewrite for them. Um, and so once Drupal, four, uh, sorry, once Mukatu 4 comes out, then we will revisit this integration and see if it's something that we would be able to do via the API rather than the sort of manual process that we have right now, which is just a report out and an import in. 
Um, any questions? I feel like we've been talking for a long time. I, I do have one question for you, Megan. Um, and I know we kind of talked about this the other day. Was it, do you have any advice that you would like to share um, for institutions who are looking for a collections management system to support their NAGPRA collections? I think it really, you know, in all things, it just comes down to what what are you trying to do and what's your needs analysis. Um, you know, I think that sometimes people sort of shop for the CMS first and then try to put everything into it. Um, and I think that, you know, just thinking, you know, about the decolonization conversation, it's it's sitting down at your organization and really mapping out, you know, what are our goals with our NAG pro program. Um, what are we missing? What things do we not have now that would be really helpful if we had in a CMS? Um, so is it that we need something to do claims management? Is it that we haven't even inventoried yet? So we need to create inventories. Um, and so understanding, you know, really what the core needs analysis is first, and then seeing, you know, what different CMSs have to offer um, in those arenas um, is always going to be the best way forward. Um, I think a lot of applications do offer demo systems. So being able to put some data into a system and really one, run your workflows through it um, to see how it would work. Can I do it? You know, does this work for how we manage commingled remains here at our, you know, here at our museum? You know, they've got these fields for commingled remains. I see this osteology inventory, but that might not be the way that you do it. And so, you know, you want to be able to sort of compare a couple of different systems. Um, and see which one you know works with your data, works with your workflows, and really supports whatever the sort of top things are that you're trying to accomplish um, with your NAGPRA program. You know, so with Ohio History, collection space is great. They wanted to get stuff. They had an access database. They wanted to get stuff out of their access database and into collection space. Um, but honestly, it was really this Mukatu in integration that's like moving their program forward and, and moving them past all of these culturally un unaffiliated materials. Whereas at the Hearst you saw theirs was more about doing all of this evidence, you know, so everybody sort of got these different goals going in. Thank you. Well, I don't wanna take up too much of the Q and A, so I'll leave it open to anybody else. Okay. I can go on to talk a little bit about um, data that work. Okay, migrations. And now my duck picture makes sense. It didn't make as much sense before, but now it makes sense, my duck and migrating. Um, so the other topic, um, when, when Alex sent out her, um, her Google form a while ago and asked what sorts of things people would like uh, their, their solution providers to talk about, you know, data and migrations, of course, is always the top of people's minds, um, getting data in, getting data out, cleaning up data. Um, so data management is one of the things I like the most um, on that person. Um, so we're going to dive in and talk about it a little bit. Um, so earlier this year, um, Elizabeth McCauley from UCLA published an article in the Code for Live journal called Always Be Migrating. Um, so the core message of this article is that rather than freaking out about migration every 10 years when you need a new system, any kind of system, um, that we should think of migration as a activity that is a phase of a life cycle and that we are always engaged in that life cycle. Um, so my colleagues are really tired of me talking about this article because <laughs> I just really like this phrase. Um, but it's just this really great way of thinking about, you know, instead of right every 10 years, oh my gosh, we have to get all of our people together and why do we have 35 different date formats? Um, but it's just something that you're thinking about all the time, just in the same way that you're thinking about cataloging or creating exhibitions, you know, think about migrating and think about the kinds of things that we can be doing to and with our data um, so that it doesn't come as this shock when we need to move to a new system, um, but we feel a little bit more confident about, about our data. Um, so Macaulay suggests some key elements in the life cycle, documentation, transparency, loving your data, um, and interoperability. And so I'll just talk briefly about how some of those things work um, within collection space. Um, so documentation. Um, so within collection space, both sort of data related and otherwise, all of our documentation is freely available. Um, so 
in the data world specifically, that means all of the data dictionaries, all of the schema. Um, those are all things that you can access via the wiki, via GitHub, um, so that there's never this mystery of what fields are available and what are they doing and why did we decide to put this data in this field? Um, and so it's really this idea about making sort of really deliberate choices about what we do with our data and also documenting those choices um, so that whoever comes behind us um, doesn't sort of wonder why. Um, so here's an example from our wiki. So you can click on any of the profiles, any of the procedures and just get a nice Excel version um, of the data model that's helpful for deciding whether or not collection space would work. Does it have the fields that we need? Um, helpful for data mapping exercises. Um, and then in GitHub, um, we've got, again, a template for every field, every procedure. Um, and those are really useful for using our CSV import tool. So you can download the templates, put the data in, and then use that CSV import tool. Also, the exports that you generate from collection space come out um, in the looking like the CSV importer wants to see them. So all the column headers are right and things like that. Um, so just this idea that, you know, your data is something that you're familiar with, you understand what all the fields are, what all those structures are, um, that it's not this big mystery of, you know, where is everything being saved? It's all really clear and open. Um, transparency um, is another one of these um, bullets. Um, and so, you know, collection space is open source. I guess it doesn't necessarily mean it's transparent by default, but we try to be as transparent as we can. Um, Decision-making flows upward from the community. So what's coming on the technical roadmap, all of those kinds of things, you know, that's all out there and freely available. Um, and there's no great mystery, you know, about what's going on under the hood of collection space. So how are things moving around and what is the data? And can I get my data out and can I have it back? Um, you know, anyone can open up collection space and take a look. The code is all there, you know, it's all available. Um, even if you have no technical resources at your museum, um, you know, understanding that if anything were to happen to Lyricist, for example, um, you know, you'd still be able to hire somebody to just install the software, get your data out, keep you moving forward. Um, and so, you know, we've got our GitHub repository, you know, here's the public browser, here's the CSV importer, it's all there, it's all freely available. Um, and then there are the four freedoms um, of free and open software, um, all of which we sub sub subscribe to. Um, collection space is licensed under um, the ECL version two license, which is uh, similar in nature to the Apache license, if you're familiar with that. Um, loving your data. So if you can't see your data, it's really hard to love it. Um, and so we really try again to think about collection space as a conduit. Uh, more than like as a black box, right? We want you to be able to get data into collection space. We want you to be able to get data out of collection space so that it's really this flow of information. It's not sort of this one-way trip where data goes in and then dies there. Um, but we really want it to be this connector, um, of course, with appropriate permissions, appropriate security, uh, but really be this connector so that your you know collections information um, is really usable and shareable. Um, and so things like reporting or creating those ad hoc exports or creating groups within your, you know, within collection space so that you can see what kinds of objects you have using that CSV import. Um, so really understanding what you have and being able to use it, work with it and send it in and out, um, I think is a huge part of being able to love your data um, is being able to actually find it and see it. And so again, there's that um, CSV importer just as an example. Um, and then finally, you know, interoperability is a verb. Um, and so, you know, we've said it a couple of times, but all the data in collection space is available via API. So even just the user interface that you look at, that's just a web application that's hitting the collection space API. Um, so this is something that's, you know, collection space was born with an API. Um, and then we have lots of other things. So um, the public browser, that's being fed from an Elasticsearch index with an Elasticsearch gateway. That provides us with a lot of cool um, features and functionality. So for example, we can have um, shared discovery. So uh, Material Order has multiple institutions who are contributing to a single public browser. And so the public browser is just pulling um, from all those little Elasticsearch gateways. Um, we have other folks who are using the API to create extracts for solar. So we have a, um, I wouldn't quite call it an integration with Blacklight, but we have folks who are using Blacklight for discovery. They're pulling data out by the API, putting it in the solar index, 
and then that's feeding their public browser. So just lots of flexibility again that collection space is a repository for your data, but then we want to make it really easy to get it out and share it um, in a lot of different ways. And so I think that's the end of our scheduled slides. So we're happy to answer any other questions um, that folks have about collection space or any of the other things that we've talked about. Well, folks are thinking about their questions. I do have a question. Um, since we are in the middle of, you know, COVID pandemic, um, I'm curious to, you know, hear if, uh, how, how the, the, the pandemic has impacted collection space users, how they're, you know, using collection space remotely. If you could speak to that a little bit. Sure. So that's been, a, that's been one of the nice things about having a web-based application. Um, there are some downsides too, but one of the really nice things about the web-based application is that you can, you can use it from anywhere. Sorry, it's raining here, so it's getting kind of dark. Um, is that you can use it from anywhere. So you don't have to be on site at the museum um, to log into collection space. And folks have different sort of security and permissions around that. Some folks want you to VPN in. Um, as we said earlier, we're working on single sign-on um, to make it easier for some of our academic partners um, to support remote work. Um, but on the whole, it's been nice for people to be able to access, you know, all the features and functionality of collection space from home. Sometimes you might not want, to, <laughs> sometimes you might prefer something that you have to <laughs> be at work to use. Um, but I think it's been a real boon for folks who haven't been able to be on site, you know, for much of the last year and a half. Great, thank you. Hey, Megan, one of the, you know, when we did that study, one of the um, things that came up uh, was preservation and mm -hmm. preservation systems. I know a lot of folks are starting to think about that. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you have a, well, Lyricist has a solution. Um, mm -hmm. could, I know it's not strictly collections management, but um, I know increasingly we're talking to museums who are looking, uh, you know, bringing in, born digital, time-based media. Are you seeing that kind of stuff? And do you want to just talk a little bit maybe about it, preservation? Sure. So um, so two answers there. So on the um, preservation side, so right, Lyricist is the home for DuraCloud, um, which is a digital preservation system. Um, and so they are actually in the middle of planning sort of for the next generation of DuraCloud. Um, that platform's been around for a while. And so they're thinking about, you know, how do they, what's, what's the next gen look like? And how specifically do they integrate with all of the other platforms that Lyricist supports? So there are a lot of us who, you know, are storage solutions for all kinds of, you know, it's just like, oh, the world's cultural and scientific heritage, you know? So we should probably figure out a way to preserve it for the long term. Um, so we actually had a really great conversation with the Dura Cloud program team um, not that long ago in terms of you know, what would be the best way to integrate with collection space. Um, and honestly, the, the sort of answer we came up with was, you know, wouldn't it be nice if it was a very sort of seamless and invisible integration where you know, something gets uploaded into collection space and then you know, as long as you've sort of checked that button, um, it just goes right into Dura space for long-term preservation, um, Dura Cloud rather, sorry. Um, you know, DuraCloud does have a dashboard. I know that there are people who like to fiddle around with, you know, what are the settings and I want to watch, see the checksums and I need that, you know, archival information packet. Um, and then there are some people who just want to know, okay, it's, it's there. <laughs> it's somewhere. I understand what the preservation reformatting needs are, you know, and, and they just want to get sort of that report. And so we're trying to sort of support, you know, both of those um, with DuraCloud. So I think that that'll be happening, you know, once they sort of figure out their path forward for that next gen, um, then, then C-Space will definitely be a part of it. Um, the other thing we're working on, just pivoting off your last um, about, you know, Born Digital um, and that world. Um, so uh, Museum of the Moving Image got a grant from the Mellon Foundation to explore this. And so we'll be working with them on a couple of different things. Um, so one is to do new extensions um, for Born Digital. So we have some things right now in our Finding Contemporary Art profile. Um, you know, if something comes in on LaserDisc, <laughs> so when I worked there, we had, you know, Nam June Pike work on LaserDisc, um, that we did a preservation reformatting, you know, to, to MiniDB. Um, and so we have that sort of thing, you know, what did it come in on and, you know, what language is it written in or, you know, did they use After Effects, you know, whatever it was. So sort of minimal um, information for that kind of stuff. 
but we're really gonna expand that to also include fields like, how do we loan this stuff out? Like, what are we loaning out? Are we loaning out the thing? Are we loaning out a copy of the thing, permission for the thing? So, so that's all gonna go in. So I think that you'll see it in cataloging, in condition reporting, conservation, loans, acquisitions, you know, everything will get sort of a little, a little juice um, from that. And then we are also in very preliminary talks um, with Archivematica about also integrating um, with Archivematica. Um, this is definitely one of those where I'm, to me right now, I'm not sure if that means that we're sending things to Archivematica, if collection space is a storage option within Archivematica. So that one is so very amorphous. So we have funding. <laughs> I have a call with the program manager for Archivematica on Monday. Um, but that one is still very amorphous. So that's like a, a stay tuned one um, rather than, it's like not even technically on the roadmap yet, um, but we do have funding for it. <laughs> so, so there are lots of different solutions that are out there. And I think it's, you know, it's a good example of sometimes things are coming in from lyricists based on the sort of, you know, work that we have there and the colleagues that we have there. Sometimes things are coming from our community in the, you know, here's the thing that we need to do. We at the Museum of the Moving Image are actively collecting born digital and we need to improve collection space in order to be able to handle that. So things are coming in from lots of different directions. A lot of exciting things going on for you guys these days. Um, <laughs> I did kind of want to jump back a little bit and hear more a little bit about the different uh, different profiles that collection space has um, for cataloging different types of objects, just because I know um, some folks who have attended our series They've had questions about institutions that have, you know, a variety of different types of collections and they have to, you know, figure, they usually have a variety of different systems to manage all those collections, but are looking for one single system to manage them all. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm super itchy. I don't know if anybody else is in Brood X territory, the cicada thing, but now the cicadas have been followed up by, I'm not making this up, the oak itch mite. They fall on you and they bite you and then you itch forever. Yeah, so we have the same in problem the, in Virginia. Yes, anybody in the Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia area, you're here with it's me terrible. itching probably. So I <laughs> so is that the second of seven plagues that you're going to get? It feels like it's it is. This like one that, is yeah. honestly, I mean, at least the cicadas, they didn't do, they didn't do anything. They sort of blew into you, but you know, I'm really over the oak itch mites. Um, Sorry, and then once I talk about it, now it's everywhere, right? Um, so I'm itching now, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, everybody is. Sorry, scrub this from the transcript, Alex. Take it out. Yeah. Um, well, let, let's see how it transcribes it first, because it might right, be hilarious. Right. <laughs> so, so with the profiles, you know, I think there's a couple of different um, there's a couple of different ways to look at it. So there's folks who have very heterogeneous museum collections. So you know. We have partners at the Oakland Museum of California, which if you've been there, they're even in the separate buildings. You know, you go outside and you walk down a long staircase. And if you turn left, you are in an art museum. And if you turn right, you're in a history museum. And if you go out and go down the stairs and turn left again, all of a sudden it's natural history. Um, and so for them, you know, collection space is a great example because they're able to pull together those extensions that support each of those. And so it's one system but they've got fields for finding contemporary art. They've got fields for natural history. They've got fields um, you know, for, for history collections. So they're able to build that sort of one system that supports all of those really heterogeneous collections. Um, at Moving Image, where the project started, that was one of the reasons why the project started is that we had a really hard time finding a system that supported our really heterogeneous collections. Like what's the system that can, you know, do both a movie camera and a Luke Skywalker action figure, you know, and art and video art. Um, so that's really one of the reasons why we started. Um, on the other side of that, I know this was like one of the impetuses, right, for the whole series is like, but what if I have museum collections and a library and an archives, you know, and that's definitely when it gets more complicated. Um, so I usually say that if you have mostly a museum, but that you also happen to have, you know, some books and you have some archival materials, you can certainly use collection space to manage those things. If you have, if those things are sort of equal within your institution, so if you have a museum, but then in that you have a sort of fully functioning archives with a professional archivist in it, she will probably not want to use collection space, right? She wants to use archive space. 
um, to manage. And so what we're trying to do is create connections. Again, this idea of C-Space as conduit so that you can use A space and you can use C space, but maybe we have shared discovery. So that's a project that we're working on lyricist wide right now is shared discovery so that the end user doesn't really care, right? Um, I care as a museum professional that I'm using a museum collections management system. The archivist cares that she's using an archival management system, two different professions, uh, but the end user doesn't care. They just wanna see all, they wanna see the Alex Cron collection, you know, whether it's your, you know, art or your papers. Um, and so it's those conduits. Um, so some, like the, the, the pilot integration that we're working on right now is to actually pull a little bit of data from A space into C space so that you can run your archival materials through like museum workflows. Like if you need to loan them out <laughs> or if you need to do conservation. Um, so that's some of the stuff that we're doing right now. Um, we're also looking at integrating with some other systems. So we have a couple libraries coming on who wanna use collection space to manage their art collections, but then they also then have some circulation issues. Um, and so we're looking at an integration with Aon, which does like circulation for special collections. Um, so that then again, if you're in the special collections library, you can request a piece of art, you can request that book or manuscript, you know, that archival material um, through a platform like Aon. So again, collection space as conduit, you know, send the data to where it's going to be useful or pull the data in from where it's going to be useful. Um, rather than, you know, we're not trying to create the one system to rule them all. The head of lyricists will probably love it if we did. <laughs> but so far, we're resisting. So far, we're resisting. Um, so cool, nonetheless. Yeah, it's really <laughs> super exciting. I don't have any other questions at this time. How about you, Nick? Um, what else can we talk about? Well, what's fast I and mean, totally aside is that you guys have moved totally remote. You are now distributed. You are everywhere and you are nowhere. <laughs> we are. We are. Lyricist really was always like a little more than half remote. Um, but yeah, since the pandemic, it's been there are a couple of people who go into the office, like, you know, the accounts receivable people are going in. Um, but pretty much the rest of us, um, we've, the staff has probably nearly doubled in the past five years and it's gone from like half of us remote to probably 90% of us remote. Yeah, sign of the times. Indeed. Yeah. All right, well. Really? Think all those people, no questions? <laughs> Come on. We answered them all. I talked a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's either good or it's bad. <laughs> That's right. It's either you answered everything or it's like, I have no idea what you were talking about. <laughs> what she was talking about. Right. right. Something about cicadas. That's what people cry. Right. I'm still itching, by the way. <laughs> Don't look them up. Don't Google it. <laughs> well, we'd certainly yeah, love to hear from anyone that has questions after the fact. I know, like, for me, when I listen to webinars, it's usually afterwards that I start thinking of some ideas. Um, and myself and Aaron and Megan were very happy to kind of chat with you about your projects. And, you know, we're just, we're very interested in this whole kind of the data concept, everything from integration to shared discovery. And we learn a lot from working with different um, users. And um, so feel free to reach out to us. And I'm happy to help connect anybody too. So mm -hmm. feel free to reach out Thanks, to Nick or myself. Okay, well, then I think on, you should call it, Alex. I was this just going to say, on that note, a big thank you to Megan, Linda, and Erin for sharing your time with us today and talking about Collection Spaces platform. Thank you for everyone who's attended and participated in the chat. Next month, we will be meeting with Art Systems to learn more about their system, and we will be sending out more information about that session in the coming weeks. We hope to see you there and that you have a great week. Uh, I will be sharing the recording of this session later on this week. You can find it on our YouTube channel, our social media platforms, and I will also be sharing it on the listservs that we have promoted this, this webinar series on. So thank you, everyone, and you take care. Thank you. Thank you.